Good afternoon. Welcome to the Broadband Community's Ask Me Anything series. I'm Drew Clark, editor and publisher of Broadband Breakfast. Super excited to welcome our guest today, Jerry Lawler, who is the co-founder and CEO of Hexvarium. And we're going to learn about what who, who Hexvarium is, what Hexvarium uh, does, and uh, we're going to see a demo, which is exciting. Uh, demo day here on the uh, near kickoff of Fourth uh, of July weekend is it is it the start of a fourth four day weekend? Not not entirely clear, but but Fourth of July is just around the corner. Jerry, welcome to ask me anything. Um, so glad to have you on the program. Thank you so much for having me, Drew. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Jerry, um, I have to start off with one of my uh, basic dumb questions. And and as a journalist, I get to ask dumb questions. It's important to ask dumb questions. <laughs> What is a hexagon and why are hexagons important for mapping or broadband mapping, Jerry? So the easiest way to think about hexagons, um, and there's a funny video I posted up in the chat if anybody wants to go look at it. It's a, a very, quite an entertaining but a useful video called Hexagons are the best of gons. Um, it is effectively the most efficient way to geospatially organize uh, areas that also maintain a, a, a much more natural relationship to each other. Like when you think, if you think about the world as a grid, the actual real world is rarely laid out in such perfect, um, in such a perfect way. Whereas hexagons can maintain as as much of a linear relationship as they can a circular relationship to its neighbors. So we use we use hexagons because again it's really efficient in covering space, but it's also very useful for us as we look at um, the optimal path in which to build. So we spend a lot of time looking at okay, we see certain things in this area, but its neighbor also matters, right? Mm -hmm. And I, you will see this in the demo as we start as it kind of makes sense, but. It's mathematical relationships is why we use hexagons. And what is it that makes a hexagon better than an octagon? I mean, a, a similarly re regular uh, polygon. It, um, what makes a hexagon more efficient is, I mean, you can push more to octagon shapes and you're not really gaining any, any benefit there. But the easiest is to compare between a a triangle versus a square versus a hexagon, uh, triangles and squares have very poor neighboring relationships. And again, I've posted some links that people can jump in and see the see sort of demonstrations of, of why. Um, a grid is too simplistic. Triangles are too haphazard. They don't have great, you know, they have awful neighboring relationships, particularly uh, north-south as much as east-west. Uh, whereas hexagons are much better in their relationship to their neighbors. Well, I'll look forward to following that link. Yeah. I'm assuming hexvarium is a play on hexagon. What does the varium in hexvarium mean? It, it's it's a play on three things, actually. Hex for hexagon. Um, alvarium is the Latin for honeycomb or beehive. So they are, in, are in our minds, the original builders of hexagons, given what uh, what bees do inside a beehive. And then the VAR, the V-A-R, the varium portion of the word, we, uh, we derive because we use a theory that is used in, financial, uh, in the financial markets um, called value at risk or VAR, right? Where we're constantly trying to compare the value of one area to another area and what's at risk when we, when we start trying to make judgments. Right, so it's kind of a, a mash of a few concepts put together and how we came up with Hexvarium. Well, exciting. Uh, looking forward to this demo, which we'll get to just now, but why don't you give us a two to three minute uh, uh, intro of how you got into this space? And obviously um, we had a piece about you, little, laying out a few of these details, but, but like where are you coming to us from, uh, Jerry? That's an important detail. Yeah. And, and what kind of got you clued into the vital importance of broadband. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky. Um, I live in a very beautiful place called Orcas Island in Washington State, about 100 miles north of Seattle. Um, it's a chain, a part of a chain of islands called the San Juan Islands, right up on the border 
uh, actually closer to Vancouver than uh, than Seattle itself. Nearly 13 years ago, I moved here from New York City um, with my then my new wife. Where my wife uh, grew up in the state of Washington, so she knew this area. And 13 years ago, we decided to do a 180 on our on our lives in New York. Uh, we were both in the financial industry. Um, working at the likes of Goldman and Bank of America and all these different uh, institutions. And we moved here with no plan and decided to kind of reinvent ourselves. I was operating, I was the COO of a, a risk management technology company that was used in the financial markets that was headquartered in Australia at the time, 2011 and 12. And I had really bad internet. Like I was, I was dying on a couple of DSL connections trying to bond them together to get maybe a meg and a half of capacity it was uh it was painful so i was living very much the covid life long before covid in many ways <laughs> and it was really frustrating and um, i found out my local electric utility uh, orcas power and light was building um some fiber about a mile away from my house to connect a substation and uh, my current, my still CTO, a chap called Adam Kelly, who I, we worked together back then, happened to see, like, recognize the fiber. I wouldn't have been able to tell a fiber cable from an electric cable to, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have stood out to me. But he's like, they're building fiber down there. You got to figure out how to get into that. So I started just digging into the subject and trying to understand, like, how could I connect and what, what could I do just for myself, right? I just want a better internet for myself. And um, the utility came back with this mission, with this goal of saying, well, it'll cost you 16000 to dig it to your home. We need a 10-year commitment to $300 a month uh, for service. And I'm justifying it in my head. I mean, when you live in Manhattan, you tend to pay for things that most other people think is insane. So I'm trying to rationalize this. And then they were like, oh, by the way, it's going to be dark. You need to figure out how to light it yourself. And that's when I was like, what? <laughs> and I started digging into that and I found out it would, I would have to buy a wholesale commercial circuit from Seattle that would cost me six and a half, seven thousand dollars a month or something. And I was like, OK, something's wrong here. I've got to This is this is not going to be sustainable. So I started just getting involved locally in the issue and the issue was growing. And, you know, we had our incumbent uh, legacy telco was frankly failing. And there were some serious issues, and that just led a, a local movement that I ended up leading. Uh, we created a, a for-profit subsidiary of our nonprofit uh, electric utility uh, called Rock Island, bought a local ISP, uh, bought Spectrum from Paul Allen's Vulcan Ventures, entered into a very unique deal with T-Mobile to build out a hybrid fixed wireless fiber network around these 20 islands. I mean, we were putting in submarine cable and, and, um, and everything in between. And the result of that ended up uh, being so successful that T-Mobile asked me to come uh, help them lead and build out their national broadband business. So the, the fixed wireless business that you see today, uh, the genesis of it was here in this community. And we, I led that build out and, um, and ran that team for a few years. And then I left T-Mobile in 2020 to start Hexvarium. Well, that is a perfect intro. Let's uh, let's see your demo, Jerry. Talk sure. talk to us uh, through the process. I I will mostly just sit quiet uh, while you while you do it, and then we'll we'll come back and continue our conversation. Yeah, let me make sure I do this correctly. Uh, ask. No, oh, where's my browser gone? Oh, I got to do this correctly. Sorry, guys. Toggle screen sharing. Uh, window crap. Okay. So let me know when that map pulls up. I'm. Yep. It's pulling up now. Okay. So what we do, I mean, the, there, there's two ways, and, and, our, and I'll just, before I dig into all the details and, and uh, start jumping around the screens and whatnot, um, can I, and is that clear to everybody? Clear as it's going to be. Uh, it looks good. Thank you, Jerry. Okay. So what we do is we've sort of two entrants into our process. So the, the goal with Hexvarium is it's not just an analysis tool up front, uh, and it's not an engineering tool. It's not a marketing tool in, in, in many ways. What we 
the way we look at it is we're trying to understand very quickly multiple factors of a given geography to get a quick sense, is there a good business case? What it, or, and or it, where are the challenging areas, right? And, and really get a, a very quick understanding of three key factors. Who and what is in a geography? What is it that I would need to build to support that geography? And what competition am I up against in that geography? And we can look at areas um, as big as states, entire states. I mean, nobody's going to go build necessarily an entire state. But we have also ways that we can look at massive geographies to find opportunities at even higher levels than the detail I'm going to show you here today. But that results in a, a, a very fast process of feasibility that takes most people quite some time. We can calculate out 20 years worth of risk in less than five business days is our usual turnaround of this data. So what we start out with is... Uh, very detailed information about every home and every business in the geography. So all the blue dots on this map is, is every individual address. All the multicolored dots are where all the businesses are. And you can kind of get a sense. You can see the businesses scattered along m main thoroughfares as you would. As you would can you uh, zoom in a little bit more, Jerry, sure. just to give us a view of close up? And just, out of, just to make sure, Drew, can you see my mouse move over here? Because the barrier is different than my browser. Yes, okay, yes we, we can okay, see good. those tabs on the left. Thank you. Okay, good, because it, 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 the line is not in place. So uh, we can I can zoom in, and I know that this is, this is Advanced Auto Parts, uh, and they're right beside Popeye's Louisiana Chicken, and uh, there's a plant uh, in Scamby Plant next door, uh, and then a uh, doctor's office and whatnot, and jewelers. So we have... We have a lot of information, not only about where businesses are, but who they are, what they are, what types of businesses they are, and the industries they're in. We have a lot of data that gets into white collar, blue collar mix. All of these things start to help us inform demand and need, given the nature of different businesses. Like a, I, the analogy I always use, a Starbucks is very different than a local cafe. They're both coffee shops. But there's different risk elements to us when it comes to trying to support them within the broadband industry. Mainly, most Starbucks don't get local buying authority, whereas a local coffee shop does. And you've got to make decisions when and how to sell to them. And we have the same on every residential location. We get into not only where every home is, but we also have a lot of data that tells us who lives in every home. So we know that this home is owned by Catherine Griffin. It is her primary residence and her neighbor are Leonard and Ilian uh, Uben and they're a married couple. The house was built in 77 and it's a 900 square foot, um, a square foot home. We, get, we know who owns every commercial property, every residential property, the, um, and a lot of detail behind that. So that also helps us in understanding family demographics and, and age demographics and income demographics, when we add a lot of that data together, we get some very precise who and what is in a given geography, right? And we use all of this data throughout our process. And um, we've also developed a fiber design, a logical fiber design to every home and business in the country. So what we do at this stage of our analysis is establish a logical buildable path to understand the distances required and a, um, a, a relatively accurate, quick understanding of the mix of below ground, below ground, uh, below, above ground, below ground within a given geography, right? Which are really the big drivers in cost estimating and trying to understand what have I got to build? Where am I going to be building it? Uh, and am I looking at, you know, very small drop densities. Am I looking at how you know how much we even get into how many state roads versus federal roads versus county roads am I building on? And that you know, there's levels of risk of what I have to build and the makeup of it in a given geography. And um, we also have a, com a competitive analysis that we perform in everywhere. So every hex bin here, we score on a ten point scale of competition, where we look at uh, the service has been offered. We, you know, we look at all through, like everybody else, through Form 7-7 and all the other data sources. 
So we, we get an understanding of who and what providers are in a given area, what technologies they're using. We look at uh, pricing data as to what service uh, product pricing they're using between both promotional and on an ongoing basis. And then we look at actual speed tests within that hex bin to compare what's being marketed to somebody and being offered to a consumer versus what they're actually achieving. And we distill all of that on, on various weighted methodologies on a 10 point scale, 10 being better for a new entrant uh, versus one being more competitive at better prices, achieving higher speeds and whatnot. So it gives us a very quick way to understand the differences between one neighborhood and another in a community. To give you an idea, uh, to, uh, each hex bin at this level of our analysis is 0.2 square miles, right? So the typical, you're talking about a few hundred residences per hex bin is the level of detail that we're getting into. You know, ranges in the most densest areas, maybe above a thousand. Usually we're looking at hex bins below 500 locations, right? And then all of that data we use to uh, distill down into what we call our hexval model, which is, is this. And each hex bin is its own set of 20-year financial analysis. So we are looking at the entirety of the CapEx expected to be deployed inside that hex bin, um, a level of take rate that we expect to be able to derive from that hex bin, the, you know, we look at income levels, um, you know, what prices we think you can achieve, the ARPU that you can achieve. And all of that gets boiled down into its own financial model that we can look at payback periods and customer lifetime value of each individual hex bin and then how they are in aggregate or, and together, right? So in doing all of that, it then allows us to start asking questions about the area. And over on the right-hand side here, you see all of the numbers to assume that, okay, if I was to build this entire geography, it's Santa Rosa County in, in, uh, in Florida, in North, uh, Northern Florida. If I was to build this entire county and we average 36% take rate across, which is what we estimate across the entire geography, uh, I was to build 100% of the backbone, 100% of the middle mile and 36% of the drops of the last miles, I would approximately be spending $164 million past 79 and a, uh, nine and a half thousand odd locations. And in this area, we see a 50-50 split between above ground and below ground, but we see that as a negative CLV over 20 years. So then we start to ask questions. Okay, well, some people want to know if I'm a just a pure investor and I want to know just maximum return. I'm a private investor and I want to know optimal return in the area. Uh, we start looking at... Um, so we start filtering. Okay, so where is, and you'll see as I start to filter out, we're never just removing the bad areas. We're always maintaining a logical buildable network because in many, like you're going to, no matter what fiber network one builds, you have to build through bad areas per se to get to good areas in many cases. You could not, you know, chat costly areas to get to more dense areas and whatnot. So we're always maintaining a buildable path through this analysis. Right, which gets back to the use of hexagons and the relationships and the, and the sort of the logistic science that we've applied in that. So we get to ask, okay, let me find optimal return. Okay, how far do I have to go? So as you can see here, I'm moving, as I'm moving down, you can kind of see the filtering coming down that road as I make my way back into these denser communities. And now I'm starting to see, okay, I've dropped from 164 million to 81 million and I've significantly dropped my average cost per passing and I'm starting to see higher CLV levels uh, yet I have I've still got the majority of the passings within the build footprint so it allows you to quickly see the extremes right and I know here the the maximum return is right around there it's right around 11.3 million in customer lifetime value is what we estimate out of this area, right? And that gives, so it gives people the immediate scale of, well, where's the optimal? Where are the challenging areas? How can I look at edge out strategies? Like if I was to build this, we have ways I can pull up other demonstrations where we can start adding in fixed wireless uh, uh, tower locations to this design to see that 
uh, if I build this much fiber and I start adding certain wireless locations to it, who can I pick up logically within um, coverage areas of that fiber network using a variety of different spectrums and technologies? The, the standard we look at, which is what most folks are using, is, uh, is the Tirana technology. And we can apply that spec immediately to this method and quickly see, okay, if I deploy here, I can pick up X customers. So it allows us to very, very quickly start at asking really smart questions about an area that then, wait, as you move through our process, we start getting into more depth around what type of network should you be building? Should you be building centralized split versus distributed split? Should you be building the same design in every hex bin? Both sides, like H patterns, I patterns, or U patterns of fiber. How do you not strand capital in areas if you're not as confident in your take rate in one hex bin versus another? These are all the types of questions we now start to ask in our process uh, as we go through it. And then ultimately, the goal of the platform is it stays involved even when you when an individual starts putting money to work. We connect into the various project management systems uh, that folks use and the, you know, all the CRMs that people use, the sales forces of the world and whatnot. And we're constantly watching how good is your build doing and is it, is it aligning with where marketing and engagement is coming from? And how is that stacking up to the assumptions that we made? It's more akin to the day when I sat on trading desks doing trades in the financial markets it's not like I just locked my assumptions in that moment in time when I did a trade, right? If I'm looking at my portfolio of risk, it's constantly changing. I made, an, I made a decision to transact, but then I've got to constantly assess that and reassess that risk to make right. adjustments. Right. This is effectively the same concept is applied here, right? Jerry, keep keep the screen open for, for, sure. for a few minutes. I've got two or three questions just on this. Do you want to show us another part of the demo too? Though, uh, there's, that's, this... I mean, there's tons more stuff. I mean, okay. I can. we've done digital okay. divide analysis across the entire country. I can dig into that, which gives us some pretty in, useful insights. We've got ways Wait. of being able to filter massive areas to find opportunities, all sorts of different things. So, it, you know, this is one of okay. many capabilities. Very good. Perhaps we could come back to something a little later, but let me just ask yeah. a couple of questions here. You, you mentioned the 36% take rate figure. Now, I don't see that on the right. You answered my question I had about what is on the right here. You're, and, and great, great discussion of this. But, but can I tweak that take rate assumption and where do I do that? We, um, so in our back end, yes, in our, in our model, we can go in and start setting different take rate assumptions. What we do in our next phase of our analysis, so we call this our detailed market analysis. In what we call our go-to-market analysis, we, we derive multiple scenarios. What we, one thing we don't like to do is peanut butter spread a take rate assumption across an entire geography, right? Okay. A lot of people we find walk into, into their models and their methodology and they've got one ARPU number and one take rate number that they apply equally. We think that's quite problematic. We can set up a scenario that shows people what those numbers look like and, and how it can get applied to the same geography. But we can also very quickly prove why we think you can only get 25% take rate in one hex bin and 45% in a different hex bin. Right? All right, now back to our hexagons. What is the hex bin versus a hexagon? Uh, the bin is literally just the la the the hexagon is just the the like a flat shape on the on the geography and the hex bin is where we start adding content to an understanding. So basically, the individual height of each of these hex bins right here, right, and that are represented by different data, and we use colors to represent their their differences as well, right? So so how how do the how do the geography space relate to the, I mean, like, can these, like, obviously a cellular network of, is, is built, I mean, when we look at maps of those, they, they can get smaller as we get more and more points, nodes in the network. Yep. Uh, is this analysis capable of being uh, shrunk to smaller hex bins? Yes. So we, if people are familiar and they can do a quick Google, and I, again, I posted it in some of the chat, and um, there's a standard that came out of Uber called H3, uh, it ranges, there's, I forget the exact number of, of hex bin structure that they have, but they, I think they go down to, 
two, three meter hex pins globally, mm-hmm. right? So, and there's a table that of various, um, of various focus. We use, um, if we're doing statewide or like multi-state analysis, we use what's called the H7 level. This is H8, and then we go to H9, which is 0.04 square mile size hex pins. So when you think about this is 0.2 square miles, we go down to 0.04, uh, and then basically at 0.04, you're looking at individual homes and businesses beyond that, right? You're down to the, that house, that address, or that business and that location, right? Right. At that point. Well, this is awesome. Let's let's go to some of the questions we've we've got uh, uh, piled up, and, and let's go ahead and, and turn our um, uh, our uh, shared screen off for, at least at least for now, so we can see a little a little clearer. So uh, here's a question that that we we've got from um, uh, uh, Nat Nguyen. So you have figured out the where, the how, and now you're adding the third dimension, the when, to the equation. What are the main challenges that you are facing when adding risk timing to this equation? And just continuing, how do you reconcile the spatial and temporal aspects of data sets to generate geospatial and time series analytics? There's, there's one more question there, but let's start with those two, okay? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty meaty question for sure. And I, and I did type up an answer to it. Um, a lot of it is, again, it's why we, you know, and I hate to use the term, but it, it's the best one that I can come up with. But when we profile an area, right, a lot of the very first thing we start to look at is, do we have an understanding of demand or need based upon the profile of a given location? Is it an older, younger, like the obvious um we get into you know the fact that we have data on household count that tells us this is an elderly couple versus a younger family. We start making demand assumptions and timing assumptions around them. Now, it's not to say that the elder couple won't buy a fiber service, but they'll probably take longer making the decision. So we ha- when we start seeing a makeup of a hex bin made up of different, of different demographic factors, we apply time values to each of those. So that then in turn, if we're applying individual metrics to every home, we then aggregate to the hex bin, which then aggregates to the entire geography. That's one way that we just, we look at, we look at who is going to be your ideal customers in year one and who's in year two and who's in year three. It's not to say you're not going to get them. It's more, when are you going to get them? We see a lot of operators make mistakes looking at neighborhoods because they're, they're wealthier and they think they're they've got and they're younger and they've got a higher demand but then we start looking at competitive factors and it may not be you know broadband desperation is easy to find right but broadband apathy is harder to find and (laughs) frankly a lot of people are lazy right in making change so again we look at we you know depending on the individual competitive analysis we see in that area, we stretch out timing different than other hex bins where we see diff- different competitive factors. And all well, of this, we're constantly kind of boiling together to assess not only here's what you have to do to be successful, but when should you best do it? And the harder part of it is then when we apply back building logical path. Right. Because, again, you can't build islands. You can't just cherry pick the perfect places in year one. You have to make some tough decisions and build in areas that may not be ideal to get to areas that feel ideal in year one and so on. Right. Jerry, it was more than 20 years ago that Scott McNeely, then CEO of Sun Microsystems, you know, had the phrase, you know, you have no privacy, get over it. And I was actually present when he said that. And, and you know, I mean, look, we all know this data, these public records, there's so many data sets is available. And yet when you just like casually toss off, hey, here's this random person here, this random neighbor, and all of the assumptions and inferences you, you get about that. I mean, let me just ask that question quickly about like, what, what, what is the state of kind of quote, quote unquote privacy in this, this world we're in where so much data is available? I mean, I wouldn't expect that people in the geospatial industry not to use what's available. But but anyway, do you have any thoughts on that? I question? mean, while I've purchased and we I buy a lot of data and we use a lot of public data, we have about, 
I think, and growing 350 different data sets that we bring into this model. Um, everything that I've procured is like the data that I just showed you is data that you could go find at your local municipality because it's all public you know, what, property information what, and right. What what are some of those primary data types and sources that you use in your mapping and risk analysis? We are across the board. I mean, we naturally have everything from the census, everything from the ACA, our the, the American communities um, data sources. We have uh, data from OOCLA, uh, Open Signal, data from uh, the precisely Lightbox, CostQuest. Um, I've got uh, geological data from the U.S. government. I've got aerial data from a variety of different sources where we're starting because I, I see one of the questions popped up about above ground and below ground. We use um, uh, street, a lot of street view data to get an opinion around what does the infrastructure look like in a given area. And we're starting to experiment. With, and and um, that's that's your assumption. That's your prediction of this percent yeah. aerial, this percent underground. Yeah. It's not based on any one else's. That's that's your kind of. We we uh, take in. we uh, that is a really tricky one to really get accurate. And we're part. We're working with um, a couple of new entities that are focused solely on that effort of can we identify very clearly not only is there a pole there. But there's even entities that are trying to get ideas of what would make ready look like on that pole versus this pole, right? And, and there, there is a push in that direction where you will actually get down to, I know where, I know where infrastructure is, and I can then put a risk, risk assessment on that infrastructure. Because in many ways, again, there's this assumption that, oh, above ground is the best way to go. But the reality of it is it depends on who owns it. It depends on the make ready. And in some instances, both the time and cost of that decision might you might be better off going below ground, even though it's more expensive per foot. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of being able to stress test that and understand it, right? In our mind, and we look at it, we have a lot of data that tells us the exact width of the right of way, right? That we know, okay, this is the space you can be in, uh, and then what is in that space? Because again, going below ground is uh, is always a speed element. If I can. It might cost me more above because I have to deal with a, a utility or a different owner, but am I going to be better off because there's just so much other stuff, water, gas below right. that's going to right. slow me down, right? Right. J Jerry, we, we had uh, Jim Stegman, the CEO of CostQuest, on and asked me anything about six weeks ago. And I think you and, and he and some others were uh, uh, from, from Ready uh, were on a panel at Broadband Communities about this subject of mapping. And, and one of the things Stegman said in the Ask Me Anything was, okay, now we, we, we did the location data for the FCC, the fabric, right? But the data about providers is, is not ours. And so I just wonder, like, how do you kind of think about this disaggregation of the data, the data about providers, the data about risk, the data that you're pulling in from other sources, like what's the way you think of your data sources as inputs and what's the output you're, you're providing to, to customers of Hexvarium, Jerry? I, I mean, the inputs never stop changing, right? We keep adding to it. And there is, a lot, there, is, there is no panacea to this data problem. We don't see any one data source as the most important to us. Right. It's really our methodology is how we have brought that data together and how we can make uh, a lot of very accurate assumptions in very small geographies and understanding the big the, the biggest lift in our in our regard is the fact that we have a very strong opinion and understanding of very small areas. Mm -hmm. And then that allows you to make better assumptions on that area versus the blending that goes on, which basically removes a true understanding of the risk you're taking in building out a massive infrastructure that's always going to be capitally intensive, right? right. And, and I think there's always a miss. Look, generally, I can't stand the in the industry where people use, it's all about just building the cheapest feed past the most amount of people. I think that's like, I hope, hopefully we're moving beyond that, right? And now that we're getting into areas where density, like when you spend enough time looking at this country, it's not a dense country. And there's nearly as many people living in edge suburban to rural America as there is living in metropolitan uh, urban America, 
right? And even urban America in this country is not a very dense place in the scheme of things, right? right? Relative to other cities around the world. So really understanding the geography and then applying, and I think the biggest part missing in everybody's model is an understanding of the customer. They tend right. to see it as an engineering problem and or a competitive problem. Like people can figure out what competition I'm going up against and people can figure out I can build something in a given geography and make it work mathematically or make it work physically. But that doesn't that doesn't guarantee you're going to be successful in the returns that you need. Right. right. We've got a we've got a boatload of great questions yeah. uh, live in addition to those that were uh, posted on the page. Uh, I'm going to ask one from Gary Lee Fry. Uh, have you looked at the state broadband maps to see what the differences are between the what current ISP states are speeds versus what the real or actual speeds. This is a huge issue. And this issue I've been kind of talking about, arguing about for 15 years, more than 15 years. And 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 again, it's just it's sickening the way the the FCC has totally put the burden of proof on the customer or the state, you know, to say you do not offer broadband at this you know, nonsense speed of 100 by 20. I mean, there's so few that are, or, or, you know, anyway, now I'm, now I'm on a rant, but, but Jerry, t talk to, talk to us about, about the, the actual versus the promise speeds and the state broadband maps and how they're doing on this. Yeah. I mean, um, like everybody suspects, but we've been able to prove to a decent degree, the problem is far worse than, um, than is ever let on. I and I'm pulling something up here to be able to just show you. Sure, go ahead. Really quick, let me. Um, and even on the definition of um, twenty-five-three and a hundred and twenty. So long. Let me reshare my screen here and get back to. Oh, share. Chrome tab. While, while you're doing that, I'll just finish Jerry's Jerry yeah. Fry's question here. He said this came up the first round and several state grants with with federal funds. ISPs gave the max speed, but with the real worth real world use, the speed dropped yeah. to where the area would qualify as unserved or underserved. But the ISP obviously wants to keep them out. So 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 talk to us now as you drill into. The, so into the what you're seeing here is actual speed test data achieved green being anyone that achieved above twenty five three and red where they were not achieving above twenty five three, right? I've zoomed into the Midwest, right, um, and you can very quickly see okay twenty five three seems achievable, you know, between Atlanta and Chicago and and the Midwest of the country. But when you start bringing, am I achieving a hundred and a hundred? What did you just do? What did you just do as you All I'm doing it? is I'm, I'm looking across two years worth of every speed test that UCLA has ever okay. received. Okay. <laughs> right. It's a massive amount of data. And I've distilled, we've distilled it down to individual hex bins and the, where that speed test came from down to again, 0 0.02 square miles. And you start to see, are people actually getting it or not, right? So this is every, so you can see that the delta between, okay, people are achieving 25.3, are people, how many, how big is the problem at 120, if that's the new, you know, going to the new definition, yet we all are on the, in the industry that we should be even way beyond 120, right as a standard so you just see the size and scale of the problem right this this is not that look i i this is why i we believe and i've dug deeper we can and i've got some proprietary stuff i can't show here right now because it's way too controversial but we can actually get down to what people are saying versus what they're achieving quite accurately and there are immense gaps all right let's let's right? go back to to questions and unshare the screen there this is from Manny Vannon, I hope I got that right. Jerry, yep. can a customer bring in and overlay, overlay their own data yep. sets like the customer's demographics, cost to acquire, cost to serve and retain so that they can estimate CLV more accurately? What yeah. do you unpack that a little bit and explain? Yeah, that. we, as part of our go to market analysis, so when we perform this detailed market analysis for our customers, the next step of our, of our process is to engage with them and learn, okay, in many cases, they already have some existing network or they have a, an understanding or a set of assumptions about a community. 
and we want the the reason we don't want any of that up front is we want to establish what we believe is just a clean baseline about the geography. And then in our next phase of our process, we start comparing. And that's where we get into scenario analysis, right? Where And you can bring your own data. We can consume that data and we start comparing it in various scenarios, right? It, again, and our, I would say our data is really no different or our output is no different. They're just good assumptions and assumptions are just that. <laughs> Right. They're just assumptions and we can make them in what we believe to be as good as possible. But at the end of the day, it's never guaranteed. And that's why we want to continue to analyze an area even after you go to market. Because mm -hmm. so much of it is about can I make sure a little problem doesn't turn into a big problem? Can I see where demand is coming from fast enough to move my capital there rather than continuing to plow capital down a path? that isn't achieving the return that we expected today. Not to say you won't go back and build it, but how do you time where you should be putting your capital and when, and you need to be on top of that. We want to get that down to at least a seven day process where okay. I know I'm putting capital out and I can receive revenue in within seven days. That's our goal. Okay. Sorry. I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily following you. Could you just yeah. explain that seven days? What do you mean seven so days? I'm constructing. We're, yeah, you're spending money. You're out building, right? The one yeah. that we, we yeah, I, I'm an ISP. I'm building. Yeah. I'm building. You're an there. ISP. You've decided this geography. We've done all our analysis. You feel really good. You're, you pop, you start putting money to work. You start going out and constructing. Generally, the time frame from which people are spending money to the time they actually start connecting customers is way too long. It's right. north of, in many cases, six to 12 months in many cases. There's, we want to, the efficiency we want to bring with this capability is can we squeeze that time down? Okay. Right. And so, ideally get it down to about seven days. So, so like stepping back at the, the this, this broadband tsunami we're experiencing, right? The, the federal government, the President Biden himself with, you know, Vice President Harris and, and Secretary Mondo made the announcement four days ago of the amounts that each state is going to receive of the 42.5 billion in the BEAD program, Broadband Equity Access and Deployment. And, and this kind of kicks off the process mm -hmm. sort of next six months, the states are going to be actively doing their plans with their money. Now, okay, so, so how, how do you see this playing out? What is the role that ISPs are going to play? What's the role that state broadband officers are going to play? And what, and what kind of do you see kind of uh, what you're doing fitting into that and, and what's the results you hope to get out of this? And um, how I see it playing out is I think like most people, there's going to be 50 unique scenarios that everybody's going to struggle to get their head around uh, given how each broadband office or each state sets up their process. And, um, you know, some states are advanced, others are way behind. And I, I think we will see uh, everything in between. Um I'm worried that, frankly, there's going to be a lot of capital given out to entities that don't deliver because they don't walk in with a clear understanding of what challenge is in front of them, both the state as well as the individual operators that start receiving funds, right? They, the, the, I, I believe when, when we've looked through our data and our analysis, it's easier, on the tr it's easier to identify the true unserved right mm -hmm. the challenge with the true unserved is is going to be getting to them and the economic argument that i need to make as an investor an operator in order to make some prior investment to set myself up to take advantage of the unserved dollars that i receive i think that's going to be one challenge and then the other challenge more on the underserved i think is going to be far greater that because it's so swiss cheese throughout right. the country and in pockets you're going to have to come up with a lot more private capital to surround an area that you might get public capital. Right, right. Right. And I think the mix of that is going to complicate people so much that they end up avoiding a lot of areas because they have to make an amount of private investment to augment this public investment. And I see that as quite challenging. Unless they can identify it, right? Uh, this is this is a great uh, segue to Jace Wilson's question about uh, talk about the origin, which you started a little bit about your your history, but but speak a little bit about what you led you to found Hexarium and what's your vision for the company? What's the long 
the long term, uh, particularly in light of this yep. broadband build out? So we started this out um, with the original view of actually being like many other. Over we operate, we own and operate network in an area in California, south of San Francisco, uh, in the peninsula. And myself and our, my other founder, Mike Farmwald, similar to me, just started putting his own money to work and built out a fiber network in his community. And when we met, we kind of created this bigger vision. And um, what we, our original plan was, let's go to the market and raise money uh, and use this technology that we were designing and starting to develop at that time and use it as a proprietary tool to express the investment thesis of a fund. Right. Where let's say we raised half a billion or a billion dollars, which, you know, you put that money to work, maybe over a five to seven year period, you're connecting a million locations around the country in various geographies that we could identify opportunity and put that capital to work. And we really just go build network because we, we believe in, you know, not only the need, but the, the economic outcomes of making smart decisions. When we went to market to raise that fund and to, talk to the infrastructure investment community when they saw the capability they were like the entire industry needs this capability right because we as sponsors and investors of operators are not getting the feedback loop that we want to see we get a lot of very um you know baked assumptions about what our money is going to do and then we see a very different result and we're very frustrated by that Right? right. People are coming in and saying they can build for, you know, X dollars below per passing. And, you know, we we fund on that and we fund on on how capable we think the management team is. But the reality is very few are in control of what actually plays out over time. And those well, returns are not fitting what our, our investment thesis. This seems to go to the risk point that you've mentioned yeah. over and over again. And we have a question yeah. from Tara Whipple about what measures are the most important in determining the risk? of a broadband investment. You might've talked already about this. But yeah, I touched it's upon it. It's really to us, it's the combination of, you know, people, the thing you got to build and the competition you're up against. And all of that is influenced heavily by the geography. The realities of the terrain is heavily influenced by the type of people, the types of businesses, the growth, the expected growth that's going to happen in communities. Um, and then you're looking at competitive factors and then how to, stress test that over time because even if i you know in that in that sample that i showed 164 million dollar investment to build out that entire county for the sake of argument you're not putting 164 million dollars to work on day one right it, it's a it, it's an investment that is only going to change over time right so how you manage and, and stress test making that investment has to be able to keep up with the inherent change that's going to occur and and in this cycle of what we do we've all witnessed most of us here on this call who deal with any customer when it comes to delivering services knows that if i give you a better broadband connection today within two years you're going to need something double in capacity right right, right. i mean it's just, it never so it, it's like you're constantly just trying to chase um and i think people like they look at this in two locked moments in time where they, they make assumptions today and they basically hold on to say, well, it's got to maintain forever. And that's just not the case. What, what's the role of co-ops in this space? And, and talk a little bit about yeah. whether co-ops were key to what you did on, on Orchestra. Absolutely. I mean, that's where it all began for me was with my local co-op, right? <laughs> with Orcus Power. And, and I look, I generally think, um, one, I have, I'm very proud of what co-ops have done, right? It, it, you know, across the board. Like, I think they've, They've really, um, I've, here's the one thing I've always said about co-ops. I love how the fact they don't call anybody a customer, they're all members and they treat everybody like a member. And I think that's a really important concept that should be brought into this, this more broadly. But even beyond co-ops, I think electric utilities are a critical part of solving this problem nationally, right? And that's where I always go back to no one balance sheet can bear the burden of this problem, right? Not even the federal balance sheet can bear the burden of this problem. $46 billion is not going to solve this problem in my mind, right? It, it, this, is, this is a shared risk uh, requirement, especially as you get out of major metropolitan areas. And it's not just money. It's also existing assets, 
like a, a utility may not have anything to necessarily do with the deployment of broadband or the management of customers on that broadband network, but they can monetize their assets in better ways, right? And I think that that's a, that changes the risk profile, right? Same with municipalities and other people that have infrastructure that, you know, state bodies, like I, I, I've spent a fair bit of time with the Washington state apparatus looking at both the DOT and the broadband office and the Department of Commerce. And I'm like, what, you know, the, the, the DOT has massive long haul cable capabilities down interstates connecting major areas. Why can't we open that up and make an right. avail of it? It's an asset you can bring to the table. Right. And that's, and to me, that's got a value that you have to be able to monitor, you know, you have to be able to, you know, calculate within a multiple pool of various inv investment types. And it's not just dollars from, we're too siloed. And that's what frustrates me. Right. And, and unless money, you know, starts to mix together, I think the are, problem are is you, are you a, 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 a financial player? I mean, do, do you see yourself playing in that space? How, what opportunities does Hexverium itself offer for broadband uh, cooperatives? Uh, from our goal, yeah, us, yeah our goal us. is to see our platform analyze 50 to 60 million locations around the country. And we charge on a per location basis. That's the size of the, the opportunity that we see. Again, our goal is to man manage the money. We're not, we're not going to be better than some engineering firm. We're not necessarily going to be better than some piece of consultancy that you receive. I, I actually think we are better in many ways, but that's a different point. But generally, our focus is on, are you putting money to work? Whatever the makeup of money is in a given geography, and that can be made up of many, many different scenarios, but are you putting that money to work in the right way over time? That's the, the view that we want to stay on, and that's the, the area that we remain focused on. Right? Gary, we've got a lot of geeks on this call, and I'm, I'm getting some, some uh, re reaction and, and, and encouragement to do, do another demo on the digital divide. So let's take another five minutes here. Uh, sure. Go ahead and share your screen on, on demo two, okay? Yeah, this is, let me, where's my San Mateo? Yeah, so this is a digital divide analysis of two counties in California, San Mateo County and Santa Clara counties, basically everywhere south of San Francisco down to San Jose, two, you know, probably wealthier of the wealthier counties in the country. The what you see is the higher, the darker the hex bin, the more bead requirement is necessary effectively. So you can tell on these fringes out here. And out here, these are very much falling into the unserved areas, right? And they're, as I said, I think they're easy to identify. Where you start to see other, more challenging is where you get underserved or all of, of these pockets within dense geographies, right? And what we've calculated out is in each hex bin, again, we like to score things. We've created a scoring method that calculates out the proximity of every home to a public institution like a library, uh, the current competition, the things that that customer can receive today, the prices in which they can receive those services, and then the amount of SNAP or social welfare utilization inside that expo. And that allows us to kind of understand the need as it relates to the, the digital divide pro or the bead process, right? And we can calculate that out accurately. And this is, it's scenarios like this where I see like we did our own, we operate network in this geography and here in the middle. And we've got, you know, poor neighborhoods adjacent to what is probably one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the world. And right next door is a pretty underprivileged neighborhood. Yet we, we wouldn't be able to get B dollars for that area. So how do you make decisions in trying to understand where that money can be put to work and where it can't be right. And, and the nature of the problem in every area. So it's a lot more nuanced than I think people give, you know, understand. And I think that's going to create the challenge for a lot of folks. So uh, a couple more quick questions and then we'll get to the, the, the close out here. Uh, Manny Vannon asks, right now, most B dollars is going to large national ISPs who have proven experience. I, I, I'm going to contest that question, but yeah, that's, so, so that's, not that's, actually. The, that's the same. <laughs> yeah. How can Hexverium help local co-ops to get B dollars? Um, so the local. So anyway, what's your reaction to this point? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, uh, we can help. We don't. Uh, 
again, we work with some of the big ISPs in the country as much as some of the smallest and down to even some tiny municipalities. And I, I don't think there's, I don't think it's going to be as black and white as people feel, right? Or as people assume. And I think the big guys are generally not going to pivot in the way people assume they will. I still think they will drive the higher level metrics that they demand that will continue to push them into areas where a lot of B dollars are not going to be applicable. Right. Um, And I think they're going to struggle as they've always struggled. Right. I mean, bead money is not new. Like receiving such funds is not a new thing. I mean, frankly, that's, I ask myself that question every day. Why do we continue to have this problem? I mean, the industry has spent trillions of dollars over the past God knows how many years, a lot of it coming from UFC funds to CAF funds to, you know, the American Reinvestment Act, like billions upon billions of dollars. Why do we still have the problem, right? I mean, it's as much an operating problem as it is a capital problem. And those two things are not very good at finding a home together, right? And that's why I think a lot of other entities need to come to the table, such as utilities, such as municipalities, and other operators that we're also starting to see that consolidation that's going to occur, right? We still have thousands of ISPs in this country. That's not sustainable, right? And I think there's going to be consolidation in the industry as much as there's going to be new entrants, new types of players going to continue to grow. So, no. And I, I, again, I don't think it's a, it's a just a public money conundrum versus just right. a private money conundrum. It, it's got to be put so, together. All about blended, blended money, yeah. blended capital. Um, let's spend the last couple minutes we have together talking a little bit about Orca Island. Okay. So, so what's, <laughs> what's it like on Orca Island? It's beautiful. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've never been there. Right. And, and, and you started out, your company started out as, I think open 5g. And yeah, and- that was, a, that was a name I inherited, which I quickly got rid of, but yeah, that uh-huh. was, um, but Orcas is a very unique place. I mean, the San Juan Islands is a very unique well, place. But, but, but let's talk about how we get broadband there. Like what, I mean, literally, oh, where is it coming in? Do you have fiber yeah. connections? And where, you know, just like a little bit about like, what's it like there and how we get that kind of better broadband to Orca Island? Yeah, we operate a, here, we operate a um, a 400 gigabit connection in six fibers inside a submarine cable that goes 10 miles at about 500 feet below the sea back to a place called Anacortes, back to the mainland. And um, we have diversity once we hit the mainland and whatnot. But we, ha- we built about 45 miles of undersea cable, usually mixed with power and, and, t- and telecommunications. And um, we've built 40 plus, 41, 42 now becoming um, 5G cell sites in the community. And we've deployed e- uh, active E fiber to the majority of homes. I'm sitting here with a, a symmetric 10 gig connection on a remote island. And everywhere I go on my cell phone, I have five to 600 megs in my pocket everywhere in a very remote community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we had to figure that out. I mean, that was the challenge. The challenge was we have a very low density very challenging topography. I mean, the, the the prior ISP we built is called Rock Island. That's very much for a reason. And 90% of the fiber we built out here is below ground because it's a beautiful place. People don't want to see infrastructure. So we had to, we had to do it differently, right? Yeah. Um, which also added to cost and challenge. But one thing we did very successfully, and this is the unusual part, Everybody partook in spreading the risk. We raised directly out of people's pockets, and it still continues to this day, uh, well north of five, probably even north of $6 million at this point, where people were cutting checks themselves to whether they were a homeowners association funding Mm -hmm. infrastructure Mm -hmm. around their neighborhood or individuals with the longer driveways. We created a financial model that allowed people to understand the real cost to them and what it took to get to them right? yeah. and how they could share the risk with their neighbors. And one thing I would love to see happen on a broader basis is how do you turn individuals and communities into your best salespeople? Because at the end of the day, that's the, the best person that's ever going to want to push 
the um, the need in a given area at a very local level? Well, this has been this has been remarkable and wonderful, and even the questions are coming in. Our, our time has expired, and we've got a uh, a, a great Fourth of July coming up. And don't forget that in two weeks' time, we have an Ask Me Anything with Christine Hallquist, the executive director of the Vermont Community Broadband Board, and on July seventeenth, we've got a special live Ready or Not. Uh, that Scott Woods will host with Gigi Sohn, okay? Gigi Sohn, who's really uh, needs no introduction, but uh, has become very active, always has been very active, but but specifically active in the uh, American Association for Public Broadband, which is super exciting. And then we've also got a Where's the Funding episode with returning guest Chris Perlitz on July 19th. And I might as well mention we've got Valerie Bullard, the director of the New Jersey State Broadband Office in four weeks' time. So lots to come up in July. The month will not uh, ease up. Jerry, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the program for this hour. Uh, Take care and have a great weekend. You too. Great time, everyone. Happy 4th.